Belichick steals it, Belichick stole the ball! Down goes Frazier! Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. It was called the golden age of sport. It was the 1920s, the roaring 20s, a rollicking, rambunctious era when Babe Ruth bashed baseballs and Big Bill Tilden bashed tennis balls. And in boxing, a long-armed, slope-shouldered predator bashed heads and became the heavyweight champion of the world. He was Jack Dempsey, and he came to us directly from the Old West. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory. Don't carry nothing but the righteous and the holy. This train bound for glory, this train. Colorado, even at the turn of the century, was still a great part of the western frontier. It was the American frontier. This is where Jack Dempsey discovered who he was and became a man. This train no care, no liar, no pocket papers, no bar flyers. He realized that if he stayed in one place, he would never succeed at anything. Sometimes children grow up before they have to. At 16, many young men, he decided to strike out on his own. This train is built for speed, fastest train He would get on the rods under a freight train and tie his hands and his legs to the rods with the bandanas so he wouldn't fall off. This train is bound for glory, this train. Railroad policemen this were always on the lookout for hobos on the train, and one time one of these policemen beat Jack Dempsey over the head several times and, and nearly killed him. Dempsey's mobile school of hard knocks carried him around the country as he learned to use his fists, courage, and anger to turn a buck. He kicked around a lot of mining towns in the West and would make money. Uh, even as a young kid fighting in, in these mining towns. And these grizzled old miners and cowpox would look at him and figure they could just take this guy out, and Dempsey generally laid them out. The rugged individualist who was not going to let anybody tell him what to do, who was going to go down fighting, who was going to whip everybody in the bar. And they would say to the bartender, do you have any really bad customers that you want to get rid of? And if you do, I'll fight them and we'll split the pot. And he went from place to place just boxing. That's all he could do. That necessity bred a survival instinct that manifested itself in the ring. After turning pro in 1914, Dempsey amassed 25 first-round knockouts. On July 4th, 1919, in Toledo, Ohio, he challenged 6'6", 245-pound Jess Willard for the heavyweight championship. On paper, the match was a modern replay of David and Goliath. But the difference was not so much in size as in talent. Here comes the champion, big and good-natured, smiling and waving to the applause. He's certain he'll win. All the advantage is on his side. Willard was a huge guy, six foot six, and he towered over Dempsey, who weighed 187 pounds at the time. He wanted some indemnification and guarantees that if he killed the boy, he would not be held liable. And Dempsey says to himself, I'm not fighting for the championship, I'm fighting for my life. If Dempsey was the underdog, his manager, the legendary Doc Kearns, regarded Willard not only as a tree to be chopped down, but a source of easy money. Kearns placed a bet of $10,000 at 10 to 1 odds that Jack Dempsey would win by a knockout in the first round. In the dressing room before the fight, Kearns says, Jack, you have to knock him out in the first round. For the first minute and a half, Dempsey doesn't even swing. It's obvious that he's a bit nervous, a bit apprehensive, a bit tentative. Then at 90 seconds, 
Dempsey throws a left hook from Olympus, and it shatters Jess Willard's cheekbone. It was so hard that Dempsey said he could hear it breaking. He's standing over Willard with his mouth snarling and teeth bared, waiting for him to get up so that he can hit him again. At this time, remember, there's no neutral corner roll. So Dempsey's staying behind him, and Willard gets up, and he's bewildered. And boom, Dempsey hits him with a roundhouse to the face. No sports writers had ever seen such a fury any time in their living experience. It looked like he'd been taken into the shop of some sadistic butcher, and the butcher turned loose on him for about 30 minutes. And at the end of the first round, Dempsey had knocked down Jess Willard seven times. The bell rings for the end of round one, and nobody hears it. The referee continues to count. And Kearns hopped in the ring and brought Dempsey out of the ring and started him toward the, the dressing room. And they realized that the whistle had been blown. The referee says, no, no, no. Willard was at seven. So they had to get Dempsey back in the ring before the next round started. Otherwise, he would have lost. With no chance to cash in on his bet, Kearns set his sights on winning the title and returned his fighter to the ring. They called Dempsey from halfway up the aisle to bring him in for the second round. By now, Willard is just a punching bag. His eye is closed, his jaw is broken, gets a couple more ribs broken in the second round from Dempsey's left hook. By the end of the third round, he's just slumped in his stool in the corner, saying, I got my farm in Kansas. I got my farm in Kansas. Willard did not get out for the fourth round. He had become a giant fountain of blood. In this most unusual of fights, an idol has been born. Jack Dempsey represented a whole new era. He comes in like a pit bull. He crouches low, his hair is shaved up the back of his head. He's got this scowl, and he's out to kill his opponent. And this excited the country. I mean, the country had just come out of the war. They wanted heroes, and boy, they loved Jack Dempsey. Instant hero. Jack Dempsey was the one who brought boxing to fame in this country. He was the most important sports figure in the world. I knew a terrific fighter named Roger Donahue, and he told me one day, he said, I grew up in a neighborhood where there were two pictures in every house, the Pope and Jack Dempsey. I remember as a child, we used to debate who was the most famous person in the world. Some said Jack Dempsey, and others said Babe Ruth. There was a continuing battle. The 1920s are the highlight of American popular sports. It's a prosperous time when the middle class has the money to spend on watching professional sports. For the millions who couldn't actually be there, newspapers, motion pictures, and radio vividly documented the events. Stars of unprecedented magnitude rose in the horizon in American culture. The golden age of sports. Dempsey, Red Grange, Babe Ruth, Bill Tilden, Bobby Jones, a pantheon of greats. The first one of which coming out of the 1919 fight is Jack Dempsey. There was no greater draw in America in sports than Jack Dempsey. We tend to think of Babe Ruth as the compelling sports icon. However, the national heroic figure was then the heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Dempsey. Dempsey represented the vanishing Old West. He was the guy who emerged out of poverty and made something out of himself. Jack Dempsey was born in 1895 in this little tiny place called Manassa, Colorado, which is, which is actually a very pretty place. And his parents were Hiram and Celia Dempsey. One of 13 children, Jack was raised in poverty. Like many American dreamers of the late 1800s, his father had brought his family west in search of a fortune he never found. Hiram Dempsey was actually quite a lazy guy and didn't get much work in Manassa or other places where he took the family in Colorado. They're following a father who's following dreams of success. When the dream doesn't pan out in one place, he goes to another place. He and his mother and a couple of his siblings were riding on a train and the conductor came around and Mrs. Dempsey said she didn't have the money for the tickets. Well, the conductor was a kindly man and he let them go, but Jack Dempsey said later that he would never be in a position to be humiliated like his mother was that day. His fists were the only tools that he could really make a living with. 
his fist with the key to freedom. In the summer of 1916, after dozens of fights and thousands of miles riding the rails, Dempsey arrived full of hope in Manhattan. When you thought about places such as New York, they became a magical element in your mind. You imagined the streets truly paved with gold. He showed his press clippings to uh, boxing writers in New York, and no one had he ever heard of anyone that he had fought. He didn't get many fights. He went to bars where there was a free lunch, and you would offer himself as a sparring partner, and you could get a dollar a round, which was pretty good money in those days. Dempsey's raw talent found meager expression in the big city. Without proper management, he was often overmatched and cheated out of his purses. He went hungry, slept in Central Park, and, like his father, watched his dreams dissolve. Dempsey, thoroughly disgusted, left New York City, broke with broken ribs, got a freight car back west. If ever there was a point in his life when he was ready for somebody to be nice to him, this was it. He found that the only thing good for him was some sort of woman's companionship, and he found it in Maxine Cates, who is a working prostitute, 15 years his senior. He worked as a bouncer in the brothels and the whorehouses where she worked. He said, I really met her on business, but I fell in love with her as a piano player. His first marriage to Maxine, I suppose you could call her a woman of the evening, wasn't a marriage made in heaven. He went out to San Francisco where he could maybe get some more fights, and that was functionally the end of the marriage. If Dempsey didn't have enough going wrong, he receives word that his brother Bruce is stabbed to death, and he doesn't even make it to the funeral in time. Not long after Bruce's death, Dempsey received an offer from Doc Kearns, an up-and-coming boxing manager who had seen him fight out west. Kearns told me when I came upon Dempsey, he was a total wreck, financially, emotionally, morally. Kearns, who had this uh, uh, incredibly brilliant, moral uh, outlook on life, saw in Dempsey a greatness that was there. Kearns builds up Dempsey's confidence, and he gives Jack a look a walk, a scowl, the unshaven face to build up his reputation in the press. Under Kearns's tutelage and promotion, Dempsey gained the attention of Tex Rickard, the P.T. Barnum of the boxing world. He was the first modern-day promoter who utilized the media, the public, the fighters. He knew how to promote a fight. Although Rickard was a visionary, he was still trying to recover from the backlash of an earlier promotion. Rickard had promoted his first heavyweight championship fight in 1910 when Jack Johnson and Jim Jeffries fought each other. Johnson destroys Jeffries, humiliates him uh, in the process, and causes an enormous stir. It led, in fact, to uh, lynchings of black people in the South. And no one wanted a black to be in this position of sort of representing American might, American character, American strength. America found its white hope in Jess Willard, a Kansas farmer who didn't begin boxing until he was 29. In 1915, Willard somehow, some way, knocked out Johnson in Havana, Cuba to become the heavyweight champion. After 1915, Willard had only had one title defense, and the fans were getting restless. Boxing needed someone who would truly catch on with the public, and Dempsey fit the bill. In his savage treatment of Willard, Dempsey scaled the heights of the boxing world. But just six months later, he was blindsided by his ex-wife, Maxine, who was still a working girl in Nevada. The other professional ladies in the brothel said, hey, you still doing two dollar tricks? And your old buddy boy is getting a million dollars to fight? You shouldn't let him get away with that. Dempsey's ex-wife went to the press with an accusation that Dempsey had avoided the draft. These were devastating headlines. Because the war was portrayed as a moral crusade, Americans were encouraged to enlist. If they didn't, they were considered to be slackers. Here is the heavyweight champion of the world. You are supposed to be the baddest man in the world. Well, we just had the baddest war in the world, and you weren't in it. Doc Kearns had pictures of Dempsey supposedly working in a shipyard during World War I, and then someone noticed he was wearing black patent leather shoes, which is not what your average <laughs> shipyard worker wore, and the press just tore him apart. Backpedaling, Dempsey claimed exemption from the draft on the basis that he was his family's sole supporter. 
but Maxine had stirred such widespread negative comment that the U.S. government brought charges against the heavyweight champion. If convicted, he could have gone to prison and would have effectively ended his career. The trial starts, and the government has some problems. Maxine makes the charges, but then a few weeks later, she recants. Gavin McGann, lawyer in San Francisco, ran a great case. He got Dempsey's mother saying what a good boy he was. Just a pillar of respectability and support during the war. The government is going to have to attack this old woman to break her story, and that's not going to happen. The trial went on for about 10 days. The jury was out for about 10 minutes. Dempsey acquitted. Despite his acquittal and an attempt to enlist in the army toward the end of the war, Dempsey's public hat changed from white to black. Boxing is always looking for figures who generate emotions and passions. Dempsey became the man that people love to hate. He was cast in the role of a villain. And what hurt Dempsey more than any punch was to be called slacker. Nobody would dare say it to his face, but it hurt Dempsey grievously. Jack Dempsey was a child that was perfect for the 20s. We were an explosive, noisy society, as subtle as in right cross to the jaw, and that right cross to the jaw was Jack Dempsey's. Well, the 20s were really an era that was bigger than life. World War I had been pretty gruesome, and people were trying to forget the war. You have prohibition, of course, gives rise to speakeasies, to bathtub gin, to millions of Americans breaking the law simply because they wanted to take a drink. When Dempsey agreed to fight George Carpentier in July of 1921, Tex Ricker demonstrated the full measure of his promotional genius by exploiting the champ's tarnished image. George Carpentier was a World War I hero, so the fight was portrayed in the media as the war hero versus a draft dodger. The fight that made sports a big-time business was Dempsey Carpentier, a battle waged at Boyle's 30 Acres in Jersey City. This was the lead story for the entire civilized world. It's a million-dollar fight. It's the first one. I mean, America just buys into it. Almost 90,000 people attended that fight. Nothing had ever been seen like it before. It is also being broadcast on radio, which is the first time a boxing match is broadcast. So it does symbolize a commercialization of the sport. Carpentier, uh, trained mostly in secret, story was given out to the press that he was developing a special punch that was going to surprise Dempsey. If you could sell tickets to a wrecking ball in a, in a house, people would stand there and pay to see it. That's what Dempsey was. He was a wrecking ball. I mean, America is, is ready for this extravaganza. They've read about it. They've heard about it. Now it's time to see who wins. Carpentier was a great, slick boxer, clever, tough to hit. Dempsey was 190 to 200, somewhere in there, and at the peak of his career. The fight went four rounds. Carpentier had a good punch, but Dempsey simply wore him down. Dempsey just, just buried him. When it ended, the Frenchman was unconscious. Suddenly, boxing was an American obsession. One man did that, Jack Dempsey. Earning $300,000 of the $1.8 million gate, Dempsey was such a hot property that manager Doc Kearns decided to promote a match between his champion and Tommy Gibbons on July 4th, 1923, not in New York or Chicago, but in Shelby, Montana. Population just under 1,000. Jack Kearns made a deal, $300,000 deal, that Dempsey would get 100000 in three installments. He gets his first 100000 no problem. Problems with the second 100000 the people who owed him money are now saying, uh, you know, well, uh, how about livestock? How about sheep? And Kern said, what would I do with 10,000 sheep in a Manhattan apartment? Lusting after national recognition, the citizens of Shelby came up with a second installment. But when they balked at making the third payment, Kern's threat to call off the fight dramatically reduced the public's enthusiasm. It's a day of the fight. Tickets aren't selling. Special trains from Seattle and San Francisco are canceled. Even if you had bought a ticket to go out there, you would have seen a bad fight. A 15-round non-knockdown fight, which up to then in Dempsey's career was very unusual. 
Unhappy enough over the uneventful fight and sparse turnout, Shelby's town fathers were absolutely distraught when they had to fork over gate receipts of more than $70,000 to make good on their financial commitment to Kearns. Built, embarrassed, and broke, Shelby was on the warpath. Four banks were bankrupted because they had tried to raise money for this fight, and a lot of people lost their fortunes and their investments. The sack of Shelby. After the Shelby fiasco, Rickard regained promotional control of Dempsey and created another million-dollar spectacle. The Manassas Mahler, champion Jack Dempsey, goes through strenuous training. He's taking purple more seriously than any opponent since he won the championship. In September of 1923, the Manassas Mahler climbed into the ring before 88,000 at New York's polo grounds. His opponent was Argentina's Luis Firpo, ballyhooed as the wild bull of the Pampas. There were huge crowds swarming around. Mounted police trying to control the crowd. Just a tremendous event. These two fighters came out and just went after each other. Firpo knocked Dempsey down. Dempsey knocked Firpo down. Dempsey was beating him up, but then Firpo landed a punch and knocked Dempsey right through the ropes. To the head and another right to the shoulder, and Dempsey is knocked over the ring. It appears as though the tables have turned, as now the champion is in desperate trouble. You see Dempsey outside the ring, knocked out, being helped back in the ring, pushed back in by the spot riders. One of the great American painters, George Bellows, did that famous boxing scene of Dempsey through the ropes, where Damon Runyon and the other writers pushed Dempsey back into the ring. We knew how Dempsey punched, but this was how Dempsey could take it. And he took out Furpo in the first minute of the second round. When was the last time anybody hears about a fighter getting knocked out of the ring, coming back in and winning? That could only have happened in this golden age of sports. Tremendous fight, and that made Dempsey a boxing immortal. That was the one that cemented it. Reinstated as the good guy, Dempsey put on his white hat and headed west to charm a young and glittering world known as Hollywood. In the early 20s, the world wafted on twin airships, the newspapers, and silent movies. Dempsey was in both of them. He is in demand at every party because he's Jack Dempsey. And he shared an apartment with Douglas Fairbanks, Sr., and Charlie Chaplin. And he said it was the best time of his life. He fell in love with an actress named Estelle Taylor. And he bought a big house, had a golf course on the property. He lived very, very well. She introduced him to a number of things, including a nose job and uh, the social graces. He's becoming a new man. And what it takes to be a boxer is fading out of his life. Dempsey and Taylor were no sooner married in February of 1925 than a war ensued between Estelle and Kearns. Each had different plans for the champ. Kearns made it a point to try and destroy that marriage. Estelle Taylor didn't want to compete any longer with Jack Kearns for uh, Dempsey's attention and affections. Dempsey finally breaks away from his manager, Doc Kearns. Nobody breaks up with Kearns and, uh, unless it's on his terms, and this wasn't on his terms. Kearns, like a scorned person, decided that he would do anything he could and that involved a great deal of lawsuits and allegations of owing money, and, and, and he just tried to demoralize him. In 1926, Dempsey was lured back into the ring by the prospect of another mammoth payday. Rickard brokered a match with rising heavyweight Gene Tunney. One segment of the boxing world, however, felt that another fighter deserved first shot at a champ who hadn't defended his title in three years. The African-American population of Harlem opposes a Dempsey Tunney fight. They want to see Dempsey take on Harry Wills, who's the black champion. That would have been a great fight. Harry Wills was a big heavyweight. He was At that time, he was 210, 215. Rickard didn't want that fight. He swore to himself he would never promote a fight again between mixed races. I don't think that Jack Dempsey was avoiding Harry Wills. He would probably have fought him had not his handlers ordered him not to. Despite Rickard's influence, the New York Boxing Commission refused to allow Dempsey to fight in the state unless it was against Wills. The Dempsey Tunney bout was moved to Philadelphia, where the long rested champion would change into another kind of people's hero. 
offering nearly half-million-dollar guarantee to Dempsey, Rickard signs Gene Tunney, newcomer, against Jack in defense of his title. When Dempsey fought Tunney in 1926, his best years were behind him. Three years since he'd fought Furpo, and he was an old fighter. Tunney was at his peak. He studied Dempsey's style very, very closely and developed his own style in a way that would uh, combat that successfully. Dad was depicted as being a sissy poo because he liked to read. They thought, if anything, he was kind of a skinny, ungainly person that wouldn't have stood a chance against the great dynamite of Jack Dempsey. The public was hungry for a heavyweight championship fight, hungry to see Dempsey in the ring again. It was so one-sided. It was all Tunney in the rain, 10 rounds of just picking Dempsey apart. Dempsey looks tired. Tunney is unmarked. Tunney gives Dempsey a shaking up with a left jab. And Tunney toyed with him when the fight was over. Dempsey's eyes were slit shut like Mr. Magoo. He tells one of his aides, take me over there, I gotta congratulate him, but I can't see him. Dempsey was finished. Tunney was the new heavyweight champion. It was like Paul Bunyan had been defeated. The fight, which drew 120,000, elicited a national characteristic that had been evolving since the birth of movies, the anti-hero. In defeat, Dempsey's popularity soared as America embraced him. In victory, Tunney was barely tolerated. My father did not mix as easily with the sports press as Dempsey had done. America doesn't want its heroes perfect. Tunney was an ex-Marine, he was an intellectual, he was, he was clean all the way through. Jack Dempsey was a flawed hero. After the fight, Dempsey came home, his face misshapen. His wife, Estelle Taylor, says, what happened Ginsburg, which was her pet name for him. And Dempsey said, honey, I forgot to duck. That comment, honey, I forgot to duck, endeared him to the American public in a way that nothing else could do. After that, the man could do no wrong. With the nation behind him, Dempsey was scheduled to meet the number one contender, Jack Sharkey, in July of 1927, when he was shocked by the sudden death of a second brother. Johnny had a star-crossed life. He followed Dempsey to Hollywood, got hooked on heroin. He ends up shooting his wife and then shooting himself. I mean, this happens just weeks before the fight. Badly shaken, Dempsey gathered himself to fight Sharkey. If he won, the next bout would be for the title against Tunney. Dempsey on the left gets belted by a beautiful left hook and a follow-up volley of punches. Sharkey has beaten him very badly for six rounds. But in those six rounds, Dempsey has constantly hit him low. And in the seventh round, Sharkey finally couldn't take it anymore, turned his head away to tell the referee that Dempsey is hitting him low. And Dempsey brings up a left hook from hell, knocking out Sharkey. This was one step above a barbarian. He would take advantage of every rule, and he broke a lot of the rules. When he turned to the referee, he said, uh, what was I supposed to do, write him a letter? Next stop, Soldier Field, September 22nd, 1927. With Rickard stirring the interest of a nation, Dempsey's rematch against Tunney inspired one influential Chicago citizen to hedge his bet. The biggest organized crime syndicate, of course, was the Capone Syndicate, based in Chicago. Al Capone had a huge bet on Dempsey, $45,000. Capone sent a note to Dempsey. I'm going to make sure that you get a fair shake. Dempsey sent back a note saying, please let sportsmanship run this and may the better man win. Unbeknownst to Dempsey, Capone had put in one of his henchmen as referee. The morning of the fight, that referee is pulled. The boxing commission has gotten wind of a fix for Dempsey, and they put in the new referee, Dave Berry. What happens then is boxing history. For second Dempsey Tunney battle, with Tunney now defending title, Rickard moves into Chicago's Soldier's Field. In 1927, Lindbergh flies the Atlantic. Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs. Talking pictures come out. It was a marvelous year, and here was Dempsey in his comeback against Tunney. Dempsey became the guy who was going to win the title back and beat this pretentious snob. Dempsey was the hero. Tunney was the villain. Over 100,000 people will attend the fight. The air was absolutely electric. It was a tremendous crowd at Soldier Field. It was the biggest crowd ever at the time to attend a prize fight. 
On the eve of the fight, two San Quentin inmates get permission from the warden to hear the contest in the minutes leading up to their execution. Irving Berlin, George M. Cohan, Al Capone, and everybody else that had a name in America was sitting 10 or 15 rows back at that fight. Tunney fought the same fight he fought the first time. Dempsey was in better shape and was crowding him, but he couldn't get to him. In the seventh round, he catches Tunney with a bodacious left hook and follows it up with a six-punch combination. Tunney is down! Tunney is down! Tunney is dazed, Tunney is down, Tunney is out. And nobody really knew he was badly hurt, but he was badly hurt, and he sat there. Dempsey, his instinct takes over. He refuses to go to a neutral corner. The referee orders him to a neutral corner. Dempsey, as in the old days, standing over Tunney, ready to pounce and destroy him. For the first time in boxing history, there is a clause that says the fighter scoring a knockdown must go to a neutral corner. Ironically, it was insisted upon by Dempsey. The referee kept waving at him to move over, and when he finally did, the time on the timekeeper's clock was five seconds. And they came back. Instead of starting on six, he started on one, two, three. As a consequence, Tunney is on the canvas for fully 14 seconds, according to the watches of all the reporters who were at the site. Eight, eight, nine, and Tunney is up, and now they're at it again. Tunney is backing away, and Dempsey is starting to get the hang of it. If he hadn't have had those extra five or six seconds, would his mind have been clear enough to stay away from Dempsey the remainder of the round? He said, I could have gotten up what I don't know is whether I could have gotten away. Uh, that extra four seconds gave him enough time. After successfully avoiding Dempsey for the rest of the seventh round, a refreshed Tunney connected in the eighth. Dempsey is down from a large left. He went down to his knees. Tunney throws a right hand that lands behind Dempsey's ear, and Dempsey drops. The referee immediately starts the count. Doesn't send Tunney to a neutral corner. This created some controversy. As soon as Dempsey goes down, the referee Dave Barry is over him going, one, that uh, suggests to me the crooked referee. Whether there was some sort of fix or whatever that hasn't been proven, what remains today is the controversy of the long count. Whatever he might have felt or knew about the legitimacy of the long count, Dempsey took the loss with grace. Jack Dempsey never complained about the losses to time which might have been the smartest thing he ever did. He was a dramatic hero before that, but when he lost a long count, now cheated in sense out of his championship, he became more endearing. Boy, this is great. Just think, overnight I've jumped right into line with the biggest producers on Broadway. I hope not. A lot of those boys are on the bread line. Fight purses, movie roles, and real estate investments had made Dempsey a multimillionaire. But on October 24th, 1929, the stock market landed a haymaker to his financial chin. He obviously got very bad financial advice. He was told to buy everything on margin. In one day, he lost $3 million. He also had to pay Estelle, who by that time had uh, instituted a divorce proceeding against him. Then he had nothing, zero. Horace Gregory was writing a poem about America in the 1930s. He used Dempsey as the central figure in the poem. Dempsey's down, but Dempsey's going to get up again. We're going to get up again. So Jack had to come back. He fought exhibition fights from 1931 to 1932. Jack was 36 years old. He fought 165 fights, two or three guys a night. He just went back to what he knew. He went back to working in the mines. He did refereeing. And slowly but surely, he made his way up again. With his fighting days over by 1933, Dempsey married another Hollywood starlet, Hannah Williams, with whom he would have two daughters. Then in 1935, Dempsey became America's favorite restaurateur. Jack Dempsey created what I would say was the first celebrity restaurant. There might have been others, but not with the, uh, a name as powerful as Jack Dempsey. And that restaurant was a smash hit. And it's a big opening. It's on every newspaper in America. He's pictured with a chef's hat on, doling out the meals. And it becomes, within a day, 
the hangout of the sports crowd. When you walked in, you were struck with this enormous painting on a plaster wall of the Dempsey-Willard fight in Toledo. It was a classic. Dempsey would greet you at the door. Dempsey would say hi to everybody. He was great. They didn't want to eat at Dempsey's, the out-of-towners and the tourists. Whatever. They wanted to see him in the window. He was the attraction, not the restaurant. My father always said, Dempsey had always told him that the minute they quit asking for my autograph, I'm dead. These are my fans, and I would never ignore a fan. I'm grateful that they come up to me. Jack Dempsey was an icon in New York. You saw the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building, and Jack Dempsey. When America entered World War II in 1941, Dempsey jumped at the chance to serve. He eagerly sought to enlist in either the Army, the Marines, the Navy. They rejected him because he was 47 years old. The Coast Guard accepted him. He became a lieutenant commander. He was put in charge of the physical fitness services. The Manasseh Mauler becomes the first lieutenant in New York State Guard. And the ex-champ likes the assignment. I think this is a really a rare privilege, one of the finest things that's ever happened to Jack Dempsey. He insisted on going in because he wanted to help the war effort, and he wanted to erase that stigma, the slacker stigma. He was the great champ serving his country. The slate was wiped clean. In 1943, Dempsey's marriage to Hannah ended in divorce. Fifteen years later, Deanna Piatelli became his fourth and final wife. They lived in New York. He ran his restaurant. Life was good as the Dempsey name aged well. I love cats better than dogs. Take it or leave it. One thing I know, cats need a very diet. Five solid foods in every can. Feed them tabby treat and you've done your job. In July of 1963, Dempsey's former manager, Doc Kearns, died. Six months later, Dempsey found himself knee-deep in a controversy surrounding his fight with Willard 45 years earlier. Kearns said that he had put plaster of Paris that set it around Dempsey's fist. And just before he was about to go into the ring, he dipped his hands into water, then put the gloves on, and of course, before the fight even started, they would harden. So that when Dempsey hit a guy, he was hitting him with uh, cement. But it's a story that one of many that Kearns told over the years. Dempsey sued Sports Illustrated for libel and received an out-of-court settlement. With the lawsuit behind him, he resumed his career as a favorite American icon, but the shadow of time was lengthening. Well, my father told me that he was uh, the toughest man he ever saw in the ring. But outside of it, he was a sweetheart, and it was true. Uh, one of the paradoxes about Dipsy was although he had all these brutal fights and a brutal childhood and youth, he hardly had a mark on him. I'd walk with him down the street or, or in the restaurant. People would say, Jack, can you do me a favor? Could you come to my church Sunday night? Can you do a personal appearance at my birthday party? Well, Jack Dempsey could not say no. When Sports Century returns, the man who couldn't say no stumps for the son of an old friend. Well, Dad always said that the long count made both Jack and him sporting immortals. I had asked my father if he would come out and campaign and bring your friend Jack Dempsey along with you. And Jack was gracious enough to agree to come out. He did a lot of campaigning. In fact, a lot of people think that it was because of Jack Dempsey that he won the election. If Dempsey's celebrity helped Tunney win, it didn't keep his landlord from closing down his restaurant in 1974, when the last rays of the golden age had faded. Many customers who have been eating and drinking at Jack Dempsey's for years say, for them, this is in every way the end of an era, a last landmark disappearing from Broadway. The link was gone to the, what they called the golden age of sports, the 1920s. It was very sad. When the restaurant closed, he was very unhappy about that. He was very hurt. He had, no, he had no place to go anymore. Dad's health was fine, I would say, until he lost the restaurant, his beloved restaurant. He suffered a mild stroke. The doctor said to him, you might never walk again. And my mother said, really? She got a stationary bicycle. She moved his legs. He trained one more time. And this man walked till the day that he died. Four years after losing his restaurant, Dempsey lost a close friend. Gene Tunney died on November 7th, 1978. 
When Dad died, Dempsey said a chunk of him went with Gene, and uh, he felt that uh, very greatly. He had sadly lost so many of his friends over the years. That's when he started to get together with me and put down his thoughts. I suppose it's known as putting your affairs in order. With his affairs in order, Jack Dempsey closed the book on one of the most colorful eras in American sports. He died of heart failure in his New York apartment on May 31st, 1983. They said when Jack Dempsey hit them in the prize fighting ring, it felt as if his boxing gloves were full of rocks. They weren't. They were filled with perhaps the hardest pair of fists in the history of boxing. He took off his gloves in 1928, had a long career outside the ring, and now he is dead at 87. He had virtually outlived all his contemporaries. I can remember going to his wake and expecting to see mobs of people, and there weren't. It was virtually empty. It just seemed very subdued. For a guy who really was, in American sports history, one of the great icons. His funeral was in Southampton. This was a very dignified, small, burial and uh, it was the way Jack wanted it. Of all the sports heroes of the 1920s, Jack Dempsey was the first to arrive and one of the last to leave. Jack Dempsey was probably the most popular champion ever, including Muhammad Ali. He put the roar in the roaring 20s. You can't envision that time frame without Dempsey as you can't envision it without Babe Ruth. He had that steely look and nothing personified being hard and being able to overcome and be successful more than Jack Dempsey. When we lost Jack Dempsey, we lost a direct link to the Wild West. The late Jim Murray wrote a, an obituary column for him, and I put it better than anybody ever did. Whenever I hear the name Dempsey, I think of train whistles on a hot summer night on the prairie. I think of a tinkling piano coming out of a kerosene limp saloon in a mining camp. I think of an America that was one big roaring camp of miners, drifters, bunkhouse hands, con men, hard cases, men who lived by their fists and their shooting irons and the cards they drew. America at high noon. In his later years, Jack Dempsey was getting out of a taxi in New York City one night when he was jumped by two men. The white-haired former champion in suit and top coat whirled on his muggers and body punched both of them to the ground. And there they remained, refusing to rise until the police came and rescued them from the elderly gentleman with the thunderous fists. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler. In the 1970s, he battled against a giant...